Hello, and welcome to another episode of Scavenger Life. This is episode number 150 on scavengerlife.com. Now, we've been talking a little bit on the blog about people who like to part out appliances and things and sell the parts for more money than they would make just selling the thing on its own. So we are talking to Jeremiah from ALC Recycling, who is parting out computers and selling them piece by piece and then recycling the rest. First, I want to welcome you. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Jay. Cool. It was interesting. You reached out to me and said that you run your whole business based on just parting out, I guess, mainly computer stuff, right? But it, you do all kinds of well, appliances. Correct. Correct. I mean... Um, the majority of our business, and probably 99%, is um, selling parts from laptops and computers that are working. Uh, we, I do, I have sold pieces, kind of like um, the people on your, the blog. I have had microwaves go bad, and decided, well, I can toss the entire thing in the garbage, or I can try to find um, portions that still work. And normally, I would try to fix it myself. But um, if not, then if it can't be fixed or if the parts to, that I need, would need to purchase would be too expensive, I would try to sell the keypads or, or other elements. Now, it's interesting. So we did an interview with Todd uh, it's Baker, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago, where he actually helped help runs a nonprofit where they collect stuff. And he's not quite, I think, as, uh, as focused as... Uh, you are, but you have an interesting business model, or I guess if that's what we just want to call it. Do, do you want to explain how it, you source your, uh, sure. your items? Sure. ALC started as a vintage computer refurbishing hobby. What I intended to do was refurbish some old computers that I had when I was a young uh, child back in the 80s. And I wanted to do so so that I could um, repurpose it with the video games that I used to play for my youth so that my kids could play them. My, my, both my six-year-old enjoy playing video games, uh, as well as my youngest. But um, the video games today are, I'm a kid out of the 80s and 90s, so they're, they're very boring to me. So um, I wanted them to go back and play uh, games where, you know, where actually you didn't get infinity lives and, and things of this nature. You actually had to try very hard if you wanted to beat it. So um, that's the way the I started off trying to um, to repurpose old computers, and of course you know uh, parts would go bad. So I would be scavenging eBay looking for old parts, and what I noticed is uh, immediately was the price differential between the parts as opposed to purchasing the entire unit. If I wanted a particular part out of a particular computer it would cost, say, between $50 to $75, where I could purchase the entire computer for $20, um, with the only caveat being that it was untested. In essence, what I tried to do was purchase, uh, I started off as purchasing whole units, going through and getting testing and getting the parts that I needed out of it, of which at, point, at that time I would have leftover parts. Um, so I, I did this for a while until I had a, you know, a supply of a, a good supply of parts in case something went bad again, and then I decided, well, you know, I have all of these extra parts. What can I do with them? Well, it, maybe you know, I wasn't the one who purchased um, the parts that I needed off eBay for fifty to seventy-five dollars, but I have extra, so, so maybe I can try selling them there. And that's really how the company began. I love that story because it's just like again, it's like one of those true scavenger stories where you really trying to solve a problem and the and the answer is always just like well let's just you know scavenge these pieces and then you realize that you can make some it's money by you know selling it to other people as well so i started you know looking as as these parts started selling i started thinking wow this is you know maybe everyone is just has this fetish for 80s and 90s computers so i started um you know asking friends and family members if they needed their old computers, you know, of course, with the idea that I would be able to purchase it off of them and, you know, part it out and resell some of these parts to these other guys who were looking uh, to do the same thing that I was. But what I what I figured out is very quickly is a lot of people didn't um, didn't have their old computer from the 90s or the 80s, but they had about four or five computers from the early 2000s. 
and maybe late 90s that they wanted me to take. So uh, I, I inherited all of these computers very quickly. I had um, you know a basement full of 10 to 15 computers of which I had I wanted nothing to do with. I didn't want anything to do with the um, these 2000 year Dells. So the same strategy, I started looking for um, ways that I can sell and move these guys. And of course, what everyone thinks immediately is, well, these are working computers. Why not install an operating system and find a good home for them? But the, the only problem is, is when you sell, say, through Craigslist, a computer with an operating system up and running, um, people expect you to warranty it. Mm-hmm. Even if you sell the computer as is with no warranties, people still expect you to um, fix the problems. And you know, I'm a pretty nice guy, and I ended up, and and I did not. I knew that I would end up fixing everyone's problems. <laughs> so, so very quickly, I decided, well, I'm not going to um, fix these computers up. And so, I was either I would give them away, maybe, but I still didn't even want to give them away because I just knew that I would end up fixing everyone's computer problems. So I decided, you know what, I can't, I, I'm just going to sell the whole unit as is. And um, so the first thing I would do, of course, I'm dealing with my friends and family is I'd take their hard drives out because, you know, this is where all their information is stored, go through and I'd wipe their hard drive, put it back in. I decided, well, maybe I'll sell it as a whole piece, but um, quickly realized that shipping would eat up any of that profit because you're dealing with you know 20 or 30 pound machines. So I decided, well, let's go back to the old model. I'll take it apart. I'll figure out what works and I'll sell the pieces. So the shipping was um, much lighter. And what I found out, Jay, is that the sum of parts is actually worth much more than the whole unit. Because someone would might be only willing to pay fifty dollars for that exact computer, but they might be willing to pay thirty dollars for one part of that computer. I was taking computers and that you know had a resale value of forty or fifty dollars, and probably making eighty to ninety dollars per unit. Now, the, of course, just like with your model, the way you and Ryan run your store, you have to be willing to set for a while because you have to be willing to. For your buyer to come along and want the particular part that you're selling. So that, in essence, that's kind of how it started. Um, and then I just, after I would started moving more product, I started saying, well, hey, can I get more and more product? And started strategizing. So what you're saying is the computers that people are willing to pay m- money for the parts are, th- are the older computers, like pre-2000? Exactly. Um, now, l- let me rephrase that. Just as you guys have have probably know better. Um, if you stick anything on eBay for long enough, it will sell. <laughs> right. I mean, I think you could take a handful of dirt and let it sit for 30 days and it would sell eventually. So you just have to have space. There are certain items that uh, sell quicker. There's this interval of, of time where, you know, so let's say anything from 2007, 2008 and up. Mm-hmm. Any computer parts from that range is probably going to sell pretty fast. Hmm. They're still in use. Then you also have a time frame maybe between uh, 95 or maybe 91 and 97. And these are also very popular models. So you, you tend to find, now of course, then you have these gaps between say 2000 and 2006 where um, you you don't find it's not a huge mark for these pieces. Hmm. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out so which parts sell the best. So the kind of the more modern ones from 2007 up, those computers are still in use and people want those. Then there's like a gap, but then it's the older computers that then also sell, is what you're saying. Absolutely. That's that's absolutely correct. I mean, just like in any in any sector you have you know, this vintage, especially with Mac, people have a, a, you know, a natural fetish, a natural fetish for the vintage Mac. Right. It didn't actually start with the death of Steve Jobs. I believe it was even prior to Steve Jobs. People just, if you remember back, uh, not a long time ago, back on the old Apple IIs and Apple IIEs, uh, and um, people used to make fish tanks out of them. Yep. If you, if you, <laughs> Oh yeah, that was very popular. Yeah. So, um, you know, but there's always been um, there's always been a, a demand for certain 
certain products. And I think it's probably a lot of nostalgia. I think a lot of people remember playing, uh, say, Oregon Trail Mm -hmm. on this computer when they were young. And they want to go back and and do the same thing, or they or if it, maybe they're like me, I, mean, I don't have time to play video games, but I do want my kids to enjoy uh, some of the things that I enjoyed when I was young. Yeah, I, I I think that's interesting because I mean, people might remember we went to a yard sale and a woman had an old Apple IIe that she had out and she just gave it to us for free. It had the dot matrix printer software. Yes. She just thought it was junk. I mean, we ended up. We didn't part it out, but we sold the computer in its different pieces, and we probably made you know eight hundred dollars on that thing. Yes, I I think that's a probably a, a little bit more harder to find finding you know really old apples like that. That, but, that is yeah. absolutely right. And there's I mean there's entire websites devoted to um, the really old uh, vintage computers. I mean there's some there's some processors out of that are um, I mean there's maybe only a handful of them left. And the world, I mean, people collect processors like they collect, uh, like they, they collect vintage coins. Is there a time frame when computer a maker stop? It's it's making those parts like after ten years or something. Right, absolutely. It's um, and there's and there's very good reason for this, Jay. If you were to go through um, a computer out of the '80s and take it apart, what they use is they use a lot of different precious metals on the mm. circuitry, and it's for connectivity issues, but. Back in the 80s, um, gold per ounce was not as Mm. expensive as it is today. And gold is uh, probably the best uh, connectivity uh, metal for connectivity there is. So um, what you'll find is you'll find lots of traces of of plated gold on the circuit boards and things of this nature and on the processors. And even though these processors are so slow in comparison (laughs) to what we have today, you know, it would still probably cost more in terms of to, to rebuild it the way it was, uh, as if you wanted it in its original form, mm. than, uh, than it would be to build some of the, the newer processors. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I am, I still, I'm still not quite clear. So why does someone want to rebuild a computer from the uh, 90s? I mean, is it really just to play an old video game? Like, can't they... Don't they make those software emulators now where you can just play old games on new computers? No, I mean, it's a very good question. I've, I, I, you can use the emulators and you can play old games very easily. Uh, there is something, uh, as I said before, Jay, something nostalgic about having mm-hmm. the system in front of you. But let's, um, but I, I, I'm with you. I don't think that's the only reason. I think, I think there are some software that is proprietary mm. and some people use, are forced to use old computers mm. because they don't want to upgrade their software. Some people have got used to using an old computer mm. and, with, and got used to using a dot matrix, uh, uh, printer and they are not willing to switch and they will invest and maybe they run a hair salon company or or something of this nature and they still print from dot matrix printers and and they still run everything out of there so i mean i assume the there's a broad range of interest of why people lo- enjoy collecting and fixing up old computers i think but i think you just said the exact thing I was going to say, and that's when we sold our dot matrix printer, I thought we were going to have to junk it, but it turns out if you find a dot a matrix printer, they sell for a lot of money because there are these companies that it created a way of doing business back in the 90s, and they don't want to change. So when their dot right. matrix its printer you know, breaks down, they have to find one, and normally they have to find them on places like eBay. So they'll pay $400 for this old printer. That's right. It's crazy. That's right. And and I've sold quite a few for the two, three, four hundred dollar range. For the, I'm sure for that reason. Yeah. So it's really just uh, <laughs> it's it's people that just like they have a certain way of doing things and they don't want to change and they're willing to deal with it, with it being slow and clunky just because it works. That's right. Leave. You're absolutely right. Okay. So we've established the fact that people like to buy these parts. Now, what's interesting is then, so if you started kind of doing this on your drone, and then you kind of ramped it up, and I don't know if uh, if you wanted to talk about how you kind of partner with the nonprofits to get uh, stuff in bulk. Sure, absolutely. So um, as I exhausted my friends and family uh, connections to with uh, electronics, I started thinking about other ways that we 
that I could collect more. And if you don't mind, Jam, I'm going to back up for just a second. Sure. The um, everything. So at some point in time, you're going to find parts that uh, do not work. If I've, you know, there, some portions may be able to be resold, other portions do not work. The main thing um, that I figured out was that there was still just like any commodity, uh, metallic commodity like steel and copper. There's also a market for old circuit boards based and it's and it's really it's a very, very hard process to explain. Even if I were to get an old computer that absolutely nothing in the computer worked, I can still take it apart the right way. I can still send the electronic um, circuit boards to a buyer out of Ohio. That, that's what we know in the electronic industry. Uh, e-waste industry as R2 certified. Hmm. So um, this is a type of government regulation that involves auditing. And really, this is to keep these circuit boards and old computers out of the land, out of the landfills of other non-developed countries. Hmm. Even the circuit boards carry a, a per pound price. So I might get a 70 pound box and I might mail it to the guy in Ohio. And I w- even so, in, I would still receive, my company would still be making money even if what we bought did not work. Mm. So as long as my price metric allowed for me to uh, purchase the, the computers at below scrap price, no matter what, I, I can still make money on the computer. So and then, of course, if things do work out of the computer, then I've more than made enough money um, from the purchase from the selling of profits. So, so real quick, so you're able to get a computer, take out the valuable part, and then even send the part that doesn't work and still make its money to it. Exactly, wow. exactly, and it's and it's hard to explain um, unless you know without getting too 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 much of the process. But let me just put it this way. Every piece inside the computer and in, inside every computer or inside every printer has a value. Mm. Even the ABS plastic mm. has a value. Some, just like you see these guys driving around throwing old refrigerators in the back <laughs> of their trucks and taking it to a, a scrapyard to get um, a, a value for that commodity. Right. Um, it's the same way thing in e-waste. And there's so many different prices and there's, it would be almost impossible for me to explain it because we are dealing with probably a hundred different prices right. inside, um, you know, inside of a computer. So, but nevertheless, I can, you know, without any, without any detriment to me or the environment, I can take a motherboard, let's say, out of a computer. I can place it into a, Fed, a FedEx box. I can then ship the FedEx box to. Um, an R2 certified recycler who will receive it, who will weigh it, who will then pay me a price based on how the weight. Right. And as long, like I, like I was saying, as long as what I'm purchasing them at is below cost, below that cost, I can still make money even if the computer doesn't work. Isn't that because the government pays because they're trying to keep a lot of these computer parts because there is some some uh, nasty stuff in computers and they don't want it to get into a landfills either in America or in other countries. Is that correct? No, it, that is correct. I mean, there is some some extremely nasty material inside of the computers. It, you know, it, if you remember the old lead-based CRT mm-hmm. class, um, you have, you know, it, there's mercury inside of LCD screens. There's lots of there's lots and lots of nasty things that are inside these circuit boards that you don't want that you don't want filled into a landfill um, because it can you know seep out into our um, water stream. And then I think the way I understand it is when if you buy a computer, part of that price is some of that its money goes to helping get rid of the older computers. Is that right? <laughs> I, I do think that's right, and I, I'm going to correct you on one part, sure. Jay, but let me but I let me expand upon what you just asked sure. because that is correct. If you if you go to the um, Goodwill or Best Buy, you will see that I I believe Dell heads what's called the Dell Reconnect Recycling Program. Hmm. So you can take in your old computer or your old monitor or your old LCD monitor, anything printer to certain Goodwills to Staples to Best Buy, and I, I, I don't quote me, but I'm, I'm almost positive Dell is behind all of that recycling portion. Hmm. So now, but back to the part about does the government actually pay for 
uh, these computers to be recycled. And mm. actually, if you remember me saying that there are precious elements mm. in these circuit boards, there is, I, I don't believe there is any um, governmental funding at all from these companies who are purchasing these circuit boards. Because what they are doing is they're aggregating and they're they're taking in thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of a certain type of circuit board and just and then they're selling it at some point in time to a refiner who then refines these precious metals out of all you know they have a, a very sophisticated machine that refines all of these precious metals out of these circuit boards which they then sell back to the marketplace. Wow. So it's really the beauty of the a market kind of taking care of itself. That's It very that's much right. is. Ex- okay. Exactly. And, and of course, you know, as, as the price of these precious metals like ounce, and I'm sorry, per ounce like gold and platinum and silver, you know, there's traces of all of these precious elements mm-hmm. in certain, certain circuit boards. Now, please let me tell your listeners, there is no point in going through your old computer <laughs> with, with, you know, and, and trying to chip out things that look like they're gold because it's very much plated and we're talking micro micrograms of plated gold. So, but it is 24 karat plated gold. Um, and this is, it, it needs to be done properly. There's, there's plenty of people on the internet who try to these um, <laughs> backcountry chemists that, that try to get the <laughs> precious metals out of these computers. So yeah, I, there is that. I believe that is actually everything about this entire recycling program is all market driven. Yeah. There are companies out there, um, for example, East Stewards and Art and R2 and things. That, and there are some companies out there that are kind of have um, taken the lead in what they consider proper recycling. And a lot of your big Fortune 500 companies do have to pay to have these things recycled. And they pay because they want um, some, you know, a company who has these certifications to go through. And um, I assume the Fortune 500 company just wants to know that it's done properly. And these these companies come in and they fill the void. So there are some companies that do have that do pay. Me, I don't have any really fancy certificates. I don't have fifty thousand dollars to spend on a certificate to promise that I won't bury this your computer in my backyard. I, I still try to deal with when I when I collect components that don't work. I still try to send to pro, you know R two certified companies some companies that uh, I know are doing a good job. Now there's also leftover materials you know like for example the the steel casings and these go to local uh, scrap yards that do the metallic recovery and things of this nature okay so yeah that's definitely a rabbit hole we can get down and the whole it's recycling thing but let's again so let's get to how you kind of ramped it up and how you started to get large amounts of this stuff by uh, working with nonprofits. So back in college, I used to have a lawn company. And what I quickly learned was that the word of mouth was the best form of marketing. So what I decided to do where my competition was, you know, taking out full one page spreads, what I decided to do was go to a couple nonprofits and say, hey, you know, would would you like me to mow your lawn for free? And, you know, and they would say yes. And they were so kind that I that they went ahead and they would they would tell people or people would find out that hey this guy is so is so awesome he's mowing you know this this nonprofit's uh, yard for free and and I don't want to try to sound like a saint I was hoping that people would spread the news of my company would spread around mm-hmm. and other people would contact me mm-hmm. but as so as I did that through this is you know back through college what I was noticing is all of these community members coming in and bringing in, say, their dog food or canned food to um, homeless shelters or food banks or dog food to these, um, to the SPCAs and the Humane Societies. And I thought, wow, you know, it's really cool to see the community support a nonprofit like this. It's just, it's really, it is really, really neat. I, I, so I went and I spoke with the director and I said, you know, I have an idea about a fundraiser. And then, so I pitched the idea and the nonprofit was totally on board and said, okay, so why don't we do an electronic recycle drive mm. where we, I can come in, I can set up a truck, and people who support your, your nonprofit can come in and bring their old computers and laptops, you know, and I will take them and I will give certificates of destruction to assure that your, everyone that their information inside their computers has been wiped. And, and then I can pay you guys based on how much I collect and based on what I can sell. 
And of course, the nonprofit had, you know, was extremely excited because they didn't have to invest any money whatsoever. To my surprise, I thought maybe I would get, you know, two or three or four computers to, you know, I ended up filling up, you know, a 10 foot box truck. <laughs> Full of everyone's uh, old computers and printers and and things of this nature. I said, wow, you know, uh, so and come to find out everyone is just keeping their old electronics stored in their closets because they don't know where to take them. They don't know what to do with them. I, I got better at these fundraisers as I as I went on. This is what I said. Wow, this is this is it. This is what I need to be doing. If I tie in my success to. Um, these awesome nonprofits successes, then, you know, if the more, the more they make, the more I make, and the more the community uh, donates, the more everyone makes. I mean, it's just, it's just an awesome way of running your company. And now I do about 10 to 15 uh, fundraisers per year. And um, it is, it's just really amazing to see a communities come together. Number one, I have so many questions here. So let's try and break this down. Um, uh, for our listeners, can you paint us a picture? So if you have all this stuff, I assume that you have like a workbench. I mean, can you walk us through how do you part out a computer? Like it's okay. right in front of you, you know? Sure, sure. I, I do have another employee that does a lot of the um, dis, disassembly process. Well, but so you're able to hire like like a part-time employee or is it like – Correct. A, wow. Correct. Cool. Yeah, so we um, – but but let me let me try to paint a picture yeah. as you see. So if I had um, a, a computer sitting on my work desk, the first thing I need to know is I need to know what works in it. I have to hook it up to a monitor and I have to – um, hook it up to a wall. I have to turn it on and I have to see, you know, what is working inside the computer. There's some things that are very easy to see if it's working. For example, when you push the button, did the computer turn on? It, when you open up the computer, are little fans spinning in inside the computer? I mean, when you hit the DVD eject button, does it the DVD player eject? Mm -hmm. Does it, you know, so I go through and I, it, you know, you get very good at it, but you go through and you test all the parts that you that are in the um, computer. And normally, in most computers that we get work. So this is it's a very quick process. Um, sometimes they don't work, or let's say a piece of the computer is not working, which at that point, it's a little bit tougher because you gotta have, you have to troubleshoot uh, what what is wrong, what's going on here. Is mm -hmm. it a power switch, or is it a power supply, or is it a video card? Um, things of this nature. So it, it helps to have a background in computers. But then as as the company grew, of course, we got some more some better equipment to test items with. So now we have um, external hard drive wipers and testers. We have external um, power supply testers. We, we, we've gotten better and quicker at, at doing this process. But when you have uh, two or three hundred computers, which we, you know, which we will, uh, you know, we, at some point in time, we'll have two to three hundred sitting in our warehouse from, you know, a pallet load that we purchased or from, a fundraiser or something of this nature. I mean, you have to develop, you have to get very quickly at going through and testing and testing and placing them off to the side and knowing when, when you come back to it, what parts need to be sold. Of course, that's just the first part. After that, that's the first part of testing it. Now you know it works, but you still don't know if it has market value. So that's, uh, so then comes the disassembly process. You take out all the screws, you carefully remove the circuit boards and you need to be able to place them in anti-static bagging so that it stays in, in working form. And then um, you need to be able to label it. What did it come out of? And then it all goes to a shelf, which later we come back to that shelf to see, okay, so now we know it works, but can we sell it? Mm. If we can't sell it, then it needs to go into the box to go to the recycling. If we if we can sell it, we go through and we, and we list it on eBay. Or if we know uh, we do have other avenues of income uh, locally, that the people who fix computers for a living, maybe we know somebody who's looking for a certain type of item. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, that's that's normally the process. It's a, it's a lot of screws. It's probably 15 to 20 screws. It's a lot of, of disconnecting of wires. It's a lot of carefully taking things out and sto properly storing them. So when you have one of these box <coughs> trucks and it backs up to it's wherever it, uh, it, you guys work, are our first piles made like these are the computers we know people like the parts and these are the ones that no one wants so these are going to go straight to the it's recycler i mean is that how it works 
Not no, not really. I mean, we, when the box truck comes up, we it's normally we just load it. I mean, we mm-hmm. just load it uh, um, front to back, trying to keep things from falling over as we drive. And then when we get back to the warehouse, is when we really go through the the process of trying to find. And 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 Jay and I've been doing this for <laughs> multiple years. I still run into computers I've never seen before. Wow. And, you know, so you you still don't know. And not only that, you Jay, you really don't know what's inside a computer. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might have this ten year old case that someone used to put you know some some newer equipment in so you really don't know everything has to be parted out correctly unless you've seen that exact item before and and i'll tell you there's if for your for any of your listeners who are thinking well you know what i have a couple computers maybe i'll go through and try <laughs> this and by all means do i i really hope you do uh just don't di- get discouraged when you look at a part and say oh my goodness there's 15 various serial numbers of part numbers and letters here. Well, how do I know what to even um, search under? Welcome to my world. This is this is the same thing. And I very often I spend two, three, four, five minutes on Google trying to figure out which serial number it actually explains this exact part. And plus, I'm just sure it's with experience. Just you get better and better and start to see some of the same things. It's just it's just like how people are like, how do you do you know what kind of a vintage antique stuff is worth anything? And it's just like it's just right. time. It's research. It's that's that right. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's a specialization of labor. You get better at it. So, yeah, by all means, the only way to get good at it is to jump in and and try it. And of course, uh, you do want to make sure, it, it, and I want to make sure I hit on a couple things because I hope some of your listeners do try some of this. Um, but you do want to make sure the part does work. A lot of times, the people who are buying from you may be a computer company that is trying to fix up a computer for a customer, and there's they nothing worse than getting a part in for a customer mm. that does not work. So my suggestion would be to please make sure you know that this item works. Don't just grab your computer and say, oh, it worked, it worked 10 years ago. Um, I'm sure it still works. Yeah. Uh, also, be careful. You don't want to sell your hard drive without wiping it, or you might end up giving all of your information to somebody who, who may do something bad with it. So this really kind of reminds me of, I mean, it just shows we're in a new age. It sounds just like the junkyard car park guys where they just buy <laughs> – you know, old crushed out cars and then <coughs> start taking apart and sell it like, you know, in pieces. It seems like the exact same thing. It, it, it very much is. It very much is. I mean, if you look at my, my, our small warehouse or, and we do my eBay stores actually ran out of my personal house, mm-hmm. but it is, it's, it's very much just filled to the brim with various parts and no one would be able to walk into that, my, these places and know what's going on. Um, there, but there is, you know, we have a system to it, to the madness. I think you guys mentioned this one time about uh, your old car, mm-hmm. about taking apart yep. when, when it goes bad, you're going to sell the parts. And there is there is companies on eBay that are devoted huh. to that huh. very same thing. They, they this is That is their niche. They go in, they purchase a car at scrap price, yep. and they go through and they take out the headlights that work and the, the you know the steering wheel and anything that is in remotely good shape, and then they sell on eBay, take what's left over to the scrapyard and still get the majority of their money back. Yeah, I mean, really, it's like there's a place <laughs> near is our house called Hillbillies. Uh, yeah. And uh, they, it's just like an old school junkyard where they just buy these junker cars and then they just throw them in a big field and then people come and pay to like, you know, take the parts they want. It just seems so inefficient. I'd be like, no, man, you got to take the car and just strip it and, you know, put it in nice boxes on the wall. I mean, they could make so much more money, you know. I know. If if you took somebody, you know, a, a place like that and you could inventory what mm. they have, the gentleman could probably retire in a year yeah. because through part sales. Yeah. But he has to wait for someone to come along and find the part that he wants. <laughs> it's just it's just like the people who buy antiques and then they just put it like in an antique mall and they wait for <laughs> you know the one person to come and buy it. It's just it's just a much more inefficient uh, method. Absolutely. And you've said a couple of things that's very interesting probably to a lot of us, and that's like storage and inventory and workspace. So you guys make enough it's money where it you've uh, rented or bought a warehouse 
No, it, and I call it a warehouse okay. shed. It's it's a very small, yeah. you know, maybe 2,500, 3,000 square foot garage oh. that we use for storage. Right. Um, and the rent's very cheap. How much? But that's, uh, it, the, the rent is about 450 a month. Oh, my God. That's very, very cheap. So is uh, it? The lighting is bad. Mm-hmm. I honestly, I mean, it's, it's not a great, it's very cold, um, in the winters, very hot in the summers, but you know what? It works. Yep. And, you know, as we grow and the company continues to grow, uh, very quickly, but as we grow, maybe we will purchase a, um, cause we're quickly outgrowing it. So yeah, the, but for inventory now, most of the, once an item has been listed on eBay, it's stored at my house mm-hmm. in my basement and we just use shelving units and we use, uh, you know, a, a type of inventory system where we label the shelving units and uh, so that I can find it after it's sold. So real quick, because I think this might be interesting to people, because I always tell people this, if you live outside of an urban area, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of abandoned buildings or, you know, unused buildings. Is your warehouse workspace just like an old car place or something or like an old Uh, industrial? Actually, I I believe so. I believe it's an old, it's actually, I think it's an old rental unit for Mm -hmm. uh, storage, but it has, but maybe it's just a large storage unit, but with a bay garage door. So maybe they used it for, um, I I don't think they used it as a mechanic, um, but they, but they probably just used it as storage and, um, I mean, maybe it was a loading bay right? because there is a retail store to the front of it. Uh, So, but yeah, it's, I mean, there's all of these places. If you're, if, you know, if you're really worried about storage, you know, if, if people that your, your listeners, if they're, inside the cities and they're and they just do not have the space inside their apartments or their townhouse i mean you can always look to um you know a storage unit you can purchase them and pay a monthly fee and i there and there's youtube is full of people that run their ebay stores (laughs) i've seen i've seen those it's videos where people are making videos inside of like a storage it's facility. I just imagine like the doors close and someone's like walking down the hallway and they hear some guy talking, you know, about yes, the, yes, about eBay. <laughs> <That's> right? <laughs> like this guy must be living. <laughs> so spacing, spacing is not an issue where I live. We still, when you're bringing in truckloads of equipment, box mm-hmm. trucks of equipment, and you need to be able to move it fast because even even when you have a three thousand square foot facility. It's very quickly it can start um, it can it can start getting piled up with spacing issues spacing issues. Um, there's always storage units. There's always places you can rent. Now, okay, so let's talk about the its process of just handling that amount of bulk. So, it, so if you're able to make enough to hire someone that works on this full time, or how many hours a week? Um, part time. Part time. Uh, probably about twenty hours a week. Okay. Uh, doing yeah. most of the disassembly process. Huh. So, so <clears throat> he she just comes in at certain hours and just starts going through computer by computer and. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I will have a list that I want them to disassemble or him to disassemble, and you know we're, we're both good friends. He can sit around and listen to music, you know, mm-hmm. wa- watch TV, and he could just be sitting there with a drill, just taking apart, you know, the computers and taking certain things out and put them in, in the right places. Uh, later that week, I will come in and I'll pick up a tote of a certain item that mm-hmm. all, all of which needs to be listed on eBay, mm-hmm. or for, or of course it needs to, a lot of times, and we need to be able to find out that can we sell it on eBay? Mm-hmm. Has it sold in the last six months on eBay? And if it did, we don't want to sell something because we have to, you know, you have to package it very well to make sure it gets there. Uh, so even the packaging supplies do cost money, the, the static baggings and, and to be able to do it properly. So we have to make sure that it's economical and, and profitable to ship the item, of which point, so I'll take that and I'll start going through a computer and doing eBay searches and Google searches to see if there's a demand for this product. Mm. And if there is, then it'll go to the next phase and get listed and be stored where I live. If it doesn't, then it'll go right back to, um, okay, well, this commodity is going into this um, box, which is later going to go to be recycled. So then he kind of does all the kind of grunt work in a way, although it's still skilled. And then it, you're the one that does the more uh, researching and listing and shipping okay. part. Okay. That's awesome. I, it, yeah. I always tell people it's so important to have, especially if you work with – someone else that everyone does something different and it really makes it like much more streamlined in my opinion i think you're i think you're spot on i mean 
there is a lot of efficiency to be gained from a specialization of labor. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the person that I have doing the testing and the uh, what I call parting out is, you know, he's much more he's much faster at it than I am Mm -hmm. now because he's been doing it for so long. Right. Whereas when I'm researching something on eBay, which again takes a skill to be able to uh, to be able to determine the pricing metrics by doing completed searching listings and being able to know wh- where our pricing point would need to be to make this profitable, uh, this is something I handle on a regular basis. I'm much faster at it. So we've tried switching roles um, sometimes uh, we have to switch roles. It's as you said, it's much more efficient if everyone has a certain particular role. Especially if you know, like with between me and Orion, I mean, we just have have naturally fell into the parts that we enjoy the most. Because the whole point of this is that it doesn't feel like a crappy job, you know. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you you tend to be better at it if you actually do enjoy the enjoy it. And I do. I enjoy looking at a <laughs> at a computer part and thinking, wow, you know, this is twenty years old. Yeah. And look at you know, look at where they placed the BIOS chip. You know, look at how they designed. I love looking at how they soldered it. You uh, geek. <laughs> I know. It's just it's that things like this are interesting to me. So it's much more fun to for me to do the research. And as my coworker he likes to, you know, he, he's more into the hardware of the, mm-hmm. you know, testing and the testing of to make sure it works. That that's mm-hmm. it. he likes working with his hands and, and getting it, you know, stuff in and out. So yeah, it works. It, it, it definitely the system works. I, I'd be happy to discuss numbers with you if you'd like. Yeah, real, real quick, I did have I, so I did have one last it's question on its process because I'm getting a good picture of of how this works. Then you know, like Todd Baker was saying at his nonprofit. They eventually have to fill up the back of a big truck, and then someone comes and takes that away, and then gives them a per price pound. What is your process for getting rid of all the stuff that doesn't work? Sure. So different items go to different locations. So the circuit boards, I I, I always send to, as I discussed earlier, Jay, and what's called an R two certified recycler. Mm-hmm. Uh, there there are various facilities all throughout. Uh, the U.S. that will pay for those those items. I send it to a certain a certain person out of Ohio. So anything that's a cert, that it, it's a circuit board gets put into a box and um, a, probably an eighteen by eighteen by eighteen box that's then um, FedExed to Ohio. Any of the the steel, so leftover computer um, casings, things of this nature. Uh, things, uh, you know, n- those are normally taken to taken to a local scrapyard. Uh, mm-hmm. Certain items we just don't accept. For example, CRT TV, CRT mm-hmm. mom. These items, I just tell the consumers, you know, your best bet is just to take it to Staples. Mm-hmm. Let Dell, let Dell recycle that properly. You know, because I there's so many people who just who do things. You, you'll see these people go around and grabbing old TVs, and they'll be ripping apart old TVs to get <laughs> copper out of them. And, you know, what they don't understand, Jay, is there's these transformers inside of these televisions that could kill you, mm. if, you don't, if you don't know what you're doing. And they're, you know, people are in there snipping wires and you know, <laughs> copper out of televisions. And um, so anyway, so those those items I we just don't accept. Uh, printers, we, you know, once we've gotten the parts out that, that do have a resale value, we're left with plastic and, and a bunch of plastic. Mm. Uh, plastic in the area that I live is actually the only commodity I don't have access to recycle. Mm. Um, now, there, there's nine different plastic types. But uh, nor- so plastic types one and two would be like, like normal household plastic, like, for example, a milk jug. And things of this can be it can be recycled, uh, but ABS plastic. I even though there is a market for it, there is there's actually people that are willing to buy it uh, from my royal location. I would have to I would probably pollute the air more mm-hmm. and exhaust than I would be saving it by by taking in a truckload of of plastic. So. Uh, they, you know, a lot of these buyers only buy twenty, thirty thousand pounds, and I just, I, I would never get that much. Right. So, so certain plastics that actually do have to go to the landfill. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plastics, uh, everything else, copper and wires, and all these go to local scrapyards. You know, you you have trash cans and boxes and Gaylord boxes and pallets and things of this nature, and they're all going to end up going 
uh, just certain destinations. Todd would talk about when people would come and donate stuff, sometimes people would come and they would bring a fairly new laptop, like a three-year-old MacBook. Does that happen to you? Yes. Yes, very often. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, normally, 90% of what we are, what is donated to us, or I should say donated to the nonprofits, is, is non-working. Probably 10% is working, but 90% is not working. But these are normally uh, something anywhere, Jay, something anywhere as small as the X or Y key was popped off my laptop. <laughs> um, to, uh, you know, the screen's not working. Pretty much, you know, a lot of these laptops can easily, easily be, be fixed. Um, you can purchase just that one key off of eBay mm. if you want to. It, and, of course, other things are a little bit harder. But, and I completely understand. I understand that you can now purchase new laptops for $300, $350. No one is willing to pay um, 100 or $150 uh, anymore to fix up a, their their four or five year old laptop. It's just uh, if, for those in the PC refurbishing um, or and not refurbishing, but maybe the PC repair business. Mm -hmm. I would assume they've probably felt of uh, this hit mm -hmm. from um, from from the from the downward cycle of prices that it's very hard to compete, and they're probably not they're probably not getting their per hour price that they were getting say ten years ago. Mm. But yes, you do you get you get lots of new um, computers and new laptops. Sometimes people upgrade really quickly. Um, you know, we might get the iPhone four uh, because somebody wanted the iPhone five. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it's so it's amazing. I, I, I one thing about working in the recycle or the electronic business. Is I've never purchased anything remotely electronic in the last <laughs> four years. I, I mean, I have all the electronics I will ever need for sure. Um, but it, it's amazing. It's amazing what people go through, um, and a lot. And I'm just happy that they want to recycle it. You know, okay. maybe they don't want to go <laughs> on and try to sell it. Um, or, or something, but I'm just happy that they didn't toss it in their trash can. <laughs> well, I'm sure many of us could understand it just like any of us that deal with like a vintage clothing or not a vintage, but just old clothing. I mean, it's just amazing. People will just give up shoes that almost seem new just probably because they bought some other shoes. And so I'm the same way. I haven't bought a new pair of clothes <laughs> in, you know, 10 years probably because you can get almost new clothes anytime you want you know right that's amazing absolutely i think this is important too for people to hear you know because it doesn't matter what anyone sells the key to success which it sounds like it you found is probably efficiency and being con assistant so is that how the uh, money comes in it was where if you're just having to consistently be parting stuff out and selling stuff every week and that's where the money comes in that I, absolutely i mean you, you have to put in your work you you really do um there's i know a lot of your listeners are probably thinking uh, you know, my eBay business is doing great. I'm ready to get out of my job. Uh, <laughs> and I hope that they do. I hope, I really hope that they can make that switch. But you, you want to get your finances together. That's, you know, even to this day, my, my company is doing pretty good and, you know, in nothing spectacular. Right. I, I don't make millions of dollars. This is not a large company. You know, my company is doing fairly well. But even to this day, I still, it is not my only source of income. Mm. And um, so that means that I have to, uh, I have, to, I only have certain days that I can devote to this company. And you really have to, you know, if you were a writer, you got to be at your desk. Mm. If, you know, if you want to be on the eBay business, you have to be listing. Mm. It's, you know, it can't all be buying and playing <laughs> and shopping. It, you have to be put in hours of work. I know, I, and I, I've heard you and Ryan talk about this, you know, where you have a, a whole bunch of clothing or shoes, and you just have to just go through it. I mean, just barrel through it. And I'm the same way. I mean, I might have, you know, 65 laptop keyboards mm -hmm. that don't bring much profit. But you know what? I just, the, you know, what's, I, I just got to get through it. I just got to just take two, three, four hours and just get this stuff listed. Right. Because, it, because if you can make $20 on each one, I mean, that's 1200 bucks. That's not bad. That's right. I mean, I'm listing, I'm listing them for say 1399 and maybe I'm making $9, $10 profit on that little keyboard, which is why I'm not, not excited. You know, it's nothing exciting about listing it. You know, 10, you know, 10 at 50, if, if you've listed 50 of them at 10, now you're, you're talking, okay, well, I can be a little bit more excited right. about that. Did you work at a college and did you teach math? 
So I'm assuming that you don't really want to get out of that kind of work, right? So is this always going to be kind of a balance between kind of extra income and another business? I, absolutely correct. Um, what I've what I learned in my 20s is that I, I, after quite a few financial mistakes is that that your income is not always safe. And I've always thought that, you know what, I've always enjoyed the fact that I, my income is needs to be diversified. Mm -hmm. So I, I like having multiple avenues of income so that no matter what upticks and downticks of the economy, I want to feel safe. And so eBay allows that in this little, my, my company allows me to have an income that I control. But even with that, I still teach and I, and I love teaching. Um, I love teaching mathematics and I, I would never give that up as well. So that's always going to be, and I also love to write and I've, I've written, um, I've written quite a few things and I, I, I don't net much income off of my writings, but it's probably enough to buy me a cup of coffee a, mm -hmm. a month. But maybe one day, maybe one day I will, I will, I will have income from that revenue from that stream as well. And um, but yeah, I, I really like the idea of diversification of income. This business will probably always be part time to full time. I have no intention of growing too large. It's I. It's not me. It's not what I want to do. Kind of like you guys, I want to own my time. The moment this business feels like it's work, it's it's going to uh, cease to exist. Um, and that's that's kind of my motto. I really appreciate talking about this because I mean, there are people who have the mindset of like they like the empire building. You know, they want to build an empire. They want to you know make millions of dollars, and that's cool. The, the world needs those people. But yeah, I, I guess that's what we try and do on this podcast is carve out a niche for those of us that yeah, like I'm not interested. I don't need a hundred employees. I don't need multi millions. You know, because like you said, then it's like a whole other thing. I can imagine someone hearing you and being like, well, why don't you get a bigger warehouse and you hire 10 people and you talk to other nonprofits and you get like 18 trucks a day and, you know, right. we can do this. <laughs> right, right. I, I think if another person was behind the wheel, that may be doable. But it's it's not what I want. And I still want to be able to come home and I want to be able to uh, coach flag football and I want to be able to uh, do other things that are fun. I want to be able to write. I want to be able to do things that I, you know, I enjoy. I still want to be able to travel a little bit with my family. So, no, I don't want um, a million, two million dollar warehouse. I don't want the debt. I don't want that come uh, that comes with uh, growing too fast. Uh, it, someone else can have it. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll power to them. Well, it you sound like a millionaire to me, that kind of a <laughs> lifestyle, you know, like being able to write, being able to teach, be with your kids. I mean, that to me, when I hear about a rich people, I just hear about people that have like a lot of their own time. And so it seems like we've all been able to kind of do that without having to, you know, have all the things in our lives that, you know, that we need to have, have all that cash, you know? That's right. That's right. And, and honestly, you know, I'll listen to other people who talk about empire building. Honestly, and I, that's why I do enjoy that you like the numbers like uh, you want to know the numbers because people embellish their mm. profits you know they they took that one week <laughs> of that one year and that's the number that they use right. for you know what they're making online my, yeah. my business is generating this much so it, you, which you know no problem if that's yeah. if they're living yeah. fancy we are if, if we aren't here to hate on people i think we're just trying to help the other people like us who they hear different things and we're just trying to like maybe kind of base things in uh, its reality because yeah i mean we've had incredible weeks but what we try and talk about is can assistancy and how it works over a long period of time because it's you know it's up and down and running a business like it you like us like others you know you have to really have the mindset it's almost like a, a meditation where you're able to have the same kind of calm week to week whether it's up or down you know that's right and and there and you need to have numbers to base it on i mean you you you, sh you don't want to be thinking about quitting your job if you've only been on eBay for for six months. I mean, unless unless there's something I'm missing because mm. you don't have the numbers to know what life's going to be like in three months from now. What are sales like in December? Right. Uh, you know, you don't have this, and you want to be to a breaking point. I would 
I would assume, because I, I know a lot of people, probably a lot of your listeners are ready to take their eBay business to the next level mm -hmm. and maybe get out of their nine to five. But try, <clears throat> you know, try living on your eBay income. Mm -hmm. next. You know, give it give it a shot. I mean, tuck away all of your other income. Try living on your eBay profits. Right. And see how you do, and, um, <laughs> and, and and you know, and I and maybe you do great. Yeah. But uh, but give it time, uh, grow your business. For me personally, I know Jay, you guys are are strictly are the majority of what your sales come from eBay. Mm -hmm. But you know, diversify a little bit. Try to find other buyers for your items. Mm -hmm. um, things of this name. Maybe I, I've never tried Amazon, but uh, maybe you know you wanted to even diversify your your income from your online sales. Right. No, I mean, you know, we talk about, we do make a full-time it's living on eBay, but one reason why we're over in Amsterdam right now is we still do our other work uh, several cool. times every a year. So we make it's money in other ways. And like you said, my heart is starting to kind of melt towards Amazon. So we may try FBA. You know? Mine, mine as well, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is a good segue and maybe we can wrap up uh, talking about your its numbers, any that you want to share. I was going through at your store and saw things like uh, motherboards were selling for like seventy five dollars. I mean, some of these right. pieces sell <clears throat> for good. It's money. Correct, correct. I'll I'll be happy to sure. um, share the uh, for for eBay sales, which I, I would assume if I had to, I should I probably have this on paper somewhere, but mm -hmm. probably seventy percent of our profits come from eBay sales. Mm -hmm. I, I would just assume something like that. Um, but in the last thirty days, the company has generated about five thousand two hundred one dollars. Mm -hmm. So it, it's nothing spectacular, right? Um, you know, in the last seven days, we've. You know, of the last seven days have only been about a thousand of that. Mm -hmm. So week to week changes. We we like I said, we do have local outlets that we move for items as well. That those are the numbers. I mean, if those are the numbers you can get when. And of course, our eBay store has has about eight hundred items. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. hope one day to have you know fifteen hundred, two thousand, uh, if I can do so without you know pulling my hair out. Mm -hmm. But that that's the type of profits you would I, I can expect. From um, an inventory of 800 items. So most of the money comes from sale on eBay, but there's still a small chunk that is that you get from sending stuff off to the entry recycler. Uh, actually, we use that just to cover all of our costs. Wow. So I don't even particularly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's uh, that's our our costs of doing business, of renting our warehouse, things of that nature, of paying my employee. Actually, I, I do have buyers, local buyers, um, throughout. Uh, you know, probably within a 60 mile radius that purchase things in bulk, um, say, say RAM, you know, or keyboards or things of this nature. I also, and I also have some wholesale buyers that are in other states that once I get a certain commodity or a certain quantity of a commodity, that they will purchase the entire lot. Hmm. So I, so I have a few wholesale buyers and eventually I want to collect more wholesale buyers because it's just more streamlined yeah. if I can send one huge box as opposed to 400 little boxes. Yeah. Just so I'm clear, so if you just focus on computers, right, if you don't take microwaves and part out other kind of electronics? No. I, I mean, I, as I said, I've done that at my own home. No, we, we just do computers, cell phones, laptops, we VCRs, stereo equipment. Hmm. These are the things that we, we sell mostly. Um, other items like, um, you know, we will take and we will recycle for you. Um, there's certain items, again, we don't take, but we will take it like a toaster that's gone bad. We will take it, you know, what? we'll, we'll take it to the scrapyard for you. Yeah. It, and, and I'll be happy to, at least, at least it's not going to get <laughs> in the trash can. Yep. Uh, but, um, but yeah, we, we focus, mostly focus on computers and electronics. Okay. Well, thanks so much for talking to us today. Well, my pleasure, Jay. Thank you guys for having me on. Cool. Thanks for coming on. I'll see you. All right. Take care. Bye.